Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. This is Helen Thomas and the CDFM Study Group. Today I'm going to be reviewing CDFM Module 2, Competency 1, Defense Budget Process out of the 2020 Study Guide. And I did notice a few minor changes from the 2018 and the older study guides, so ensure that you pay attention to the updates in the 2020 study guide. All right, so the DOD mission is what it is. It is to provide the force necessary to secure and defend the Constitution, to support and defend our nation, our country, and our, and our um, allies. Because again, if you don't defend your allies, eventually their enemies will become your enemies and your problems. So that's why we assist other countries. So the reason for knowing the Department of Defense mission is because the allocation of resources is dependent on who is in charge of those particular portions of the DOD mission. So on page 219, it goes into the involvement of the DOD, where it starts with the Army, Navy, Marine, Air Force, but in the 2020 study guide, there's an addition of Space Force. And the Space Force was created December 2019. So that's different from the older study guide. So got to make sure that you review the information in the new material. So the Space Force is now in act in <laughs> the Space Force is now one of the DOD assets. And it was created or it evolved in December 2019. So make sure you annotate that. All right, so we're going to be looking at the structure of the Department of Defense, what the roles and responsibilities are. So let me pause here. Module two seems to be the most difficult for individuals taking the CDFM. Why you say? Not because the material cannot be learned, it's because it's a lot of it. It's a lot of key individuals. They produce documents in the process and the various processes are compounded upon each other. So you have to be able to separate. Again, when you study for the CDFM, picture a blank sheet of paper and you're able to then take all the jumbled pieces and put them in the right order. So that's your goal for module two. You cannot just simply learn the material page by page and think you're gonna be successful on the exam. You have to comprehend what is being stated in the material. What's going on in the budget process? Who's involved? What are they doing? Why are they doing it? So those are the types of questions you're going to ask. So at the DOD staff level, we're going to be looking at different staff members and their responsibility in this whole resource management DOD budget process. So I'm going to jump to page, let's go to the bottom of page 2112, where it begins with the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Remember that your president is a civilian your Secretary of Defense is a civilian. Your top military advisor to those individuals is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So I wanna put that out there first. So each of those services that we looked at before, the Army, the Navy, the, the Space Command and so forth, they all have joint staff or they have representative at the joint level to be able to decipher what are the military requirements to meet that security or that safety need. So the chairman on the top of page 13 is the spokesperson, is the commander, is the supervisor of all the individual chiefs of staff. So all the individual chiefs of staff report to the chairman and the chairman is the top military advisor to the Secretary of Defense, to the President, and the National Security Council that we're gonna talk about in a little bit. In the middle to the bottom of page 13, another key individual that you're going to 
have to learn about is the vice chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, the second in command. The reason is that vice chairman plays several additional roles than just, okay, we'll step in when the chairman is unavailable. Okay, well, we know that's what a second in command does, but some, there are some additional roles that the vice chairman plays. And you can see the bullets on the bottom of page 13. Performs duties if the chairman's not there, acts as chairman, holds the grade of a general or an admiral. But that last bullet is important because it's going to come up several times. The vice chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff is also the chairman of the Joint Requirements Oversight Council, the JROC. Keep that in the back of your mind because we're going to talk about the JROC in a little bit. But I'm just building the stages now as we go through the material. So, vice, so the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff is a top military advisor to the Secretary of Defense. That's again, civilian, civilian, military. So if you're talking DOD assets, you want your top military person to advise your civilian. It makes sense. Next, you have on page 14, the combatant commands. Going back to the mission of the Department of Defense, which is to provide security, provide safety, protection, you, not, you need a force to do that. So those combatant commands on page, let's see, 15, where you have the various combatant commands, areas, those areas will then be managed. And don't, that means your globe is broken down, NORTHCOM, SOUTHCOM, you have Space Command, you got all these commands where you, where the area of the world is broken down. And then on page 14, you have combatant commands. Those are commanders that are in charge of those particular areas of the map. So whatever resources that they need to be successful becomes priority for resourcing. So on page 15, again, with those combatant commands, because I think this number is different from the older study guides, you have 11 combatant commands. So just make sure you review that list of combatant commands, the different areas, and make sure that you understand it. What I wanna point out, and I don't see it anywhere else on the bottom of page 15, that slide in the bottom left, is when it comes to operations and the actual execution of those operations, the operational chain of command runs from the president to the sec def to those combatant commands. Why is that important? Remember, I just told you, the top military person is the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff. He's just an advisor. So that's why the chain of command does not go from the president, sec def, to the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff to the combatant commands. The operational chain of command based on the bottom of page 2115, bottom left, is runs from the president to the sec def to the combatant commands. However, the chairman does play a role because the orders of the president and the sec def is communicated. Again, military talks to military. Make sure they understand what their responsibilities are. The orders of the president and the sec def are transcribed and transferred to the combatant commanders through the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, or the Chiefs of Staff, right? The Joint Chiefs of Staff. As if it's an army asset, an ar army it has the responsibility for that area, then it makes sense that the chairman will have the army relay that information. On page 16, another key entity is the National Security Council. So think of the biggest, the top, um, command, like if, since we operate in commands and sub-organization. So your top command in the country is a National Security Council. That's the president's forum to determine the priorities, to determine the threat of the nation. What do we have going on and what do we need to establish our priorities? So that forum that the president has is the National Security Council. So what the National Security Council does is they sit down and they analyze 
what's going on in the country. You have your threat brief. You have your ch chairman comes in, what's going on in the military forum, what's going on in the treasury. Department of State comes in to identify what's going on in the State Department realm. And then the, that council will then determine what are the priorities for the command. So the top of page 17, which is different from the older study guides, the standing members, the primary members, the president, the vice president, the secretary of state, secretary of energy, and the old study guides will probably say secretary of energy and water, and then the secretary of the treasury are all primary members, which is unique because you figure the treasury should have been up there before but if you look in the older study guide the treasury used to be uh at the bottom the bottom list the standing participants if needed so president vice president secretary of defense secretary of state secretary of energy and department of treasury so the secretary of the treasury those are the six members and then we talked about advisors so we know we have the chairman for the military perspective, chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, and you also have the director of national intelligence to give the intel of what's going on. And then you have some other members at the bottom, but if nothing else, know the primary members and the two advisors for the National Security Council. So on page 18 and 19, now what the National Security Council does once they determine what the priorities are, what the, the threats are, then they will then publish the national security strategy. This is the nation strategy and how we're going to meet and defeat our problems. So the national security strategy NSS document can be viewed as your big op order. So you know in your organization, regardless of what service, whether you're in the Army, Navy, Air Force, if you're in a military service, you have to operate on some type of orders. So your national security strategy is that big op order. What do you do when you get an op order? You take the op order, you go through it, and you find a section that applies to you. Is it something to do with the Army? Is it a DOD level type strategy to fix the problem? So what the DOD does is then determine what's the DOD strategy going to be once they review the NSS document. Because again, everything's got to be in line at the DOD level to make sure that they meet the national security strategy. So a couple of things and a couple of documents used by the SECDEP is on page 19. Again, if you have subject matter experts within your organization, you're going to reach out to them. So part of that is that national military strategy. Again, your SECDEF is a civilian, so it makes sense that he uses his subject matter expert in the military, the top military advisor, which is the chairman. So the chairman develops the national military strategy based on what it says in the national security strategy based on what the SECDEF um, objectives are, then the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff develops the national military strategy. So make sure you understand that. Even though we get our guidance from the SECDEF, the person that creates, the person that develops the national military strategy is the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff. However, when we get the document, it's not national military strategy, it is the national defense strategy because it includes other things like homeland security defense. So that means the homeland security folks also provide information to the sector for inclusion into the defense strategy. So then the DOD will take the national security strategy and establish what are the defense strategy that will meet this big op order. So part of that is you having to go through the resourcing process, which is what we call the PPBE process, plan, program, budget, and execute. 
that is a DOD support resource management system that is used to articulate that strategy. How do we request the resources that we need to accomplish that strategy? We use different resource management systems and we're going to go through each one of those. So as we do that for the PPBE, we're going to look at, before we go into the full-fledged um, PPBE process, we have to look at the roles and responsibilities of some of the DOD secretariats, officers. So in the top of 22, we already talked about the SECDEF, we talked about the Joint Staff, Combatant Commands, we talked about the Vice Chairman, um of the joint chief of staff and the heads of the components are those in charge of the army army secretary arm navy secretary and so forth so that's what heads of components mean so on page 23 you have which everybody should be familiar with in financial management is the under secretary of defense comptroller you need to know the roles and responsibilities they are numerous but some key things, yeah, they're in charge of, they're the chief financial officer, they're in charge of the resource management, the budget, but the key thing when it comes to the PPBE process is they're responsible for the budgeting phase of PEEP and the execution phase of PPBE. But so that starts from budget formulation to budget execution. That is the responsibility of the USD Comptroller, along with all the other bullets you see on page 23. On page 24, you have another key player, the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy. And as you read through the bullet, the first one says, conducts and coordinates the planning phase of PPBE. That's important, right? because we're going to go through the PPBE process and it's important to know, well, who's in charge of planning? Who's in charge of programming? Budgeting, execution. So budgeting and execution, I just told you, is the USD control. So the planning phase of PEEP is a responsibility. The generator, the person in charge, the oversight is the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy. Now remember this. If they work for the DOD, and chances are their title begins with the Under Secretary of Defense. If a response is the Assistant Secretary of the Army or Financial Management and Control, well, ASA says I'm at the Army level and so forth. So if, again, this is a DOD level exam, so chances are they're not going to ask you much information from the DOD and below other than commit, obligate, give allotments, and so forth. So the primary focus is on the DOD level and those agencies and up to OMB, the president, Congress, legislative, Office of Management and Budget. Those are the terms that you have to be familiar with. GAO, Government Accountability Office why are they important? So planning phase of P is a responsibility of the USD for policy. Programming. So we already have, well, let's continue with the book. Page 25 is the Undersecretary of Defense. Oh, and this is different. Let me put a note because this is new. The name, it used to be on the Secretary of Defense for Acquisition Technology and Logistics, ATNL. Well, in the 2020 book, the title is now the Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment, ANS, USD ANS. That's the senior acquisition executive at the DOD level. On the Secretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment, senior acquisition person at the DOD level. Another key player that comes in when you talk about research and development is on page 26, which is the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. So as far as the, the they're the chief financial, chief <laughs> CIO, the chief information officer, chief technology officer. So your CIO, and this is all different from your older study guys, is the USD 
RE, research and engineering. I'm just writing it in my book so it kind of sticks out in my mind because I don't remember ever learning about the USD RE. All right, so that's the planning phase. The programming phase on page 27 falls under the Director of Cost Assessment and Program Evaluation, the DCAPE. The DCAPE has a bunch of responsibilities in the PPBE process. Primarily, he's responsible for the programming phase of PEEB. He's also responsible for what we will learn, which is the Future Year Defense Program. That's a DOD database that keeps track of the resources. It keeps track of the equipment, the personnel needed to do this mission, the appropriations we use to do this mission. So the cost guy makes sense, right? Because your DCAPE is your cost guy. That's one of the few whose role does not start with Under Secretary of Defense. So let me point that out also. So this is the senior cost guy at the DOD level is the DCAPE, responsible for the programming phase of PEEB, responsible for the update of the future year defense program. FIDEP, FYDP, it's good to know acronyms, but make sure you know what those acronyms mean. At the bottom of page 27, they touch a little bit, seems like it just comes out of nowhere, but you'll see it again, mainly in module 2.2, that cost and economic analysis, the defense acquisition board. So remember, in the beginning, we talked about the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, and I talked about the vice chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff being the chairman of the Joint Requirements Oversight Council, right? So he's got a board that he's in charge of. On page 27 at the bottom, you have the Defense Acquisition Board. That means somebody has to be in charge of the board. That individual is the USD for Acquisition and Sustainment. That USD ANS person that we just talked about a couple pages back is the senior acquisition person. So it makes sense that he's the chairman of the Defense Acquisition Board. So why did I bring up the vice chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff again? Because as you will see, the vice chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff is a co-chairman of the Defense Acquisition Board. So not only is he the, the vice chairman, is the chairman of the Joint Requirements Oversight Council, chairman of the JROC, he's also the vice chairman or the co-chairman of the Defense Acquisition Board. So he sits on these boards, they have representative on the different boards to ensure that everything synchronizes to meet the Defense Acquisition Plan and also to meet the defense strategy, the national defense strategy. So page 29 has a, a 28 rather, 2128 has a chart that you should be familiar with. Everything that the Department of Defense does, Department of Defense does, falls into one of those three circles. And in the middle of the circles, as they overlap, you see the national defense strategy. That op order, everything is working in sync to meet the national defense strategy. And what does the national defense strategy tries to meet? The national security strategy, which is created by the National Security Council. So going back to page 28. So the order you should learn these on, bottom left is JSIT, Joint Capabilities Integration and Development System. At the top is the PPBE process. The bottom right is the defense acquisition system. Why do you want to learn them in that order? Well, let's remember the acronym because you're going to see it again in module 2.2. But once we have, since we have this chart, let me go over it. If you work in TRADOC, you're prefer, probably familiar with this acronym, .MLPF. What that means is to determine what is needed, what resources are needed, the analyzers will look at doctrine. Do we need to change the doctrine to fix the problem? Do we need 
to change the status of the organization, the structure of the organization? Do we need more positions? Do we need more supervisors? So each one of those, doctrine, organization, training, material, leader development, personnel, facilities, are viewed in an analysis. What is that analysis? The analysis is number one, J6. So the vice chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff and the JROC, because he's a chairman of the JROC, they have oversight of J6. So what happens is once the national defense strategy comes, then the vice chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff need to determine what capabilities do we have and determine what are our capability gaps? What are we missing to meet that strategy? And then the third step is not just identify we got a problem, oh yeah, we're missing some capabilities, but the third step is what is it going to take to fill that capability gap? So the what is it going to fill uses that .MLP gap. Changing, we need more people, Personnel, we need more buildings, facilities. What does it need to fill that capability gap? So that is the purpose of that first DOD support system. There are three DOD support systems, JCITS, PPBE, and the Defense Acquisition System. So in JCITS, if it's anything other than a material solution, you go to the PPBE process first. If the JROC determines that it requires a material with the EL, it's an equipment solution to fix the capability gap, then that is what triggers the defense acquisition system. Let me repeat. During that analytical process of the JSITS, Joint Capabilities Integration and Development System, the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff and the Joint Requirements Oversight Council, he's a chairman of the JROC, they do that analysis. Once they identify the capability gap by looking at .MLPF, Doctrine Organization, Training Material, Leader, Personnel, Facility, and if they determine it requires a material solution, that is the trigger that they need to go to the defense acquisition system. If they simply need to change the other stuff, the training, the personnel, because again, money got to go with it, right? We need resources. We need more people, manpower. You got to go to the PPBE process to do that. So I just wanted to do that. JCIS identify capability gaps. PPBE gets me the resources, the funding, the money, the manpower, the equipment, and the defense acquisition system will procure, will buy, will research, will develop the material solution to fill that capability gap. Continuing on page 2131, well, now we're going to go individually into the planning, programming, budgeting, and execution phase of PEEP. So as we say the planning phase of PEEP, your next question should be, well, who's in charge of planning? The Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, because we just learned that in the beginning. Now we're tying what we learned in the front of the book to the different section. The second question, not just who's in charge of it, but what is the final document? You can learn that now. The final document in the planning phase of P is a defense planning guidance, DPG. So as we now have a strategy, we have to come up with a plan to actually put this into place. So. DOD has to issue guidance to the subordinate organization so that we know what's the plan, what are we trying to do? We can't all just come up with our own plans. So based on the national security strategy, DOD comes up with the national defense strategy. Within that national defense strategy, you have the national military strategy, which was created by the 
chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, and the Homeland Security Administrator also provides input so that the DOD can come up with the DPG. So you can look through all of the information from page, that page to page 33, Joint Planning, because what I want to look at goes on page 34, which is the term Integrated Priority List. What is that? So remember that other key individual, key players are those combatant commanders. So anytime you hear the word IPLs, Integrated Priority List, automatically your mind should go to combatant commanders because they provide, they develop the IPLs. Remember, operational chain of command runs from the president, sec def, to the combatant commanders. So the combatant commanders need to let their superiors know what their problems are. They need to let them know what resources they need in their area for them to be successful. So they then publish or submit an IPL and they send it to the SECDEF, the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff and the military department responsible for the asset because the combatant commanders do not own these assets. So if it's an army asset, they're also gonna send that information to the army level. So the IPLs are associated, they come from combatant commanders and the combatant commanders gives a heads up to the SECDEF, the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, right? Top military person, even though he's not in the, necessarily in the chain of command, but he's in the communication chain of command and the military department. So that's the planning phase in a nutshell. On page 35, you go into the programming phase of P. So as you're going through planning, programming, budget, and execution in the back of your mind, just remember, future year defense program, future year defense program is being updated. Once they finalize the defense planning guidance and the numbers and resources necessary, that future year defense program is coming into play. And you're going to see that in a little bit. That comes into play in the programming phase of PEEP. Who did we say was in charge of programming? The DK, Director of Cost Assessment and Program Evaluation, is responsible for updating the DK, the, the, for up, updating the Future Year Defense Program, and he is in charge of the programming phase of PEEP. Is that my mind is racing before I get there? <laughs> All right, so what are we talking about? Future Year Defense Program begins on page 37. It's a DOD database. And if you look at the slide at the top of page 37, automated database that summarizes all the forces, all the resources, and all the equipment necessary to accomplish a particular program. So... We're gonna come back to page 37 because I like diagrams. They jump on page 38, which is a diagram of the future year defense program. So if you notice one through 12, it means every mission that the DOD accomplishes or does falls into one of those 12 categories, mobility, strategy, deployment, all of those missions fall under the DOD's privy. So the DOD, the Future Year Defense Program is a DOD database that keeps track of those programs and the resources necessary, the appropriations, the services that uses those appropriations to accomplish those programs. So I just wanted to show a visual. Going back on the bottom of page 37, it throws in the president's budget. So remember, by law, the president's budget must be submitted to Congress, not the first Monday in February. It says no later than, so that means it can be submitted before. So don't get caught in just saying first Monday in February. No later than the first Monday in February, the press budget must be submitted to the legislative branch. So Future Year Defense Program, DOD database. 
In this study guide, that's the only one that uses the term database. So if you see that, it should kind of help you to remember. That's FYDP, DOD database. Remember the 12 programs that uses appropriations by different services. So it keeps track of all of that. Who's in charge of updating the future year defense program? That is the DCAPE. And the DCAPE is in charge of the programming phase of P. So you have some other decision-making forums on page 39 that goes over when you send your POMs. So you should associate program objective memorandum POMs with the programming phase of P. As you submit your POMs, you also have decision-makers, three-star level, deputy management action group, and Secretary of Defense Group, depending on what the, what level those decisions need to be made. You need to go to those levels. So review those, please. All right, on the top of page 41, it talks about the Chairman's Program Assessment. Remember, Chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, just because you submit your POM, it does not just simply go to the DOD level without getting looked at at the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff level, the Joint Staff level. So the Joint Staff will then review your POM request. And the chairman does his assessment and then provides his decision, his input. So the, each individual service Joint Staff will look at the what your POM says for Army, Navy, Air Force, and Space Command and then they'll do their, once they do their assessment, they make a decision, and then that chairman will provide and advise the SECDEF on the, the military assets necessary to accomplish that mission, to be able to go forward for it to get approved by Congress. So the final document in the programming phase of PEEP, this is also identified as something different. If you read the bottom of page 41, that note, it used to be called resource management decision. And as it says, our legacy documents used in the early 2010s, and they took it out the study guide in place of PDMs and program budget decision. Now it's called program decision memorandums. So the final document in planning was the defense planning guidance. The final document in programming is PDM, Program Decision Memorandum, which makes sense because as I'm thinking of acquisition, the PDM was the document that they were updating on that, but you'll see that in 2.2. All right, the third phase of PEEP is page 42, budgeting. Who do we say is in charge of budget and execution? The USD Comptroller. So we know that up front. We also want to know what's the final document, but we're going to go through some stuff first before we get to the final document of the budgeting phase. So USD Comptroller is in charge of developing the budget estimate submission. So remember, programming and budget occurs at the same time. They just go through different um, channels. And when they get to Congress, it's different committees in Congress that looks at them. So page 43 starts with the budget estimate submission. That's building your budget request to ask for budget for the upcoming fiscal year. They go through the budget review on 44, but I want to go to page 45 where it talks about comptroller information system. So remember, your future year defense program is being updated in the programming phase of P continuously. But on the budget side, we're updating the Comptroller Information System. So remember I said FYDP was the only time the word database was used, but another automated system is the Comptroller Information, the CIS. Comptroller Information System is the budget system that is updated by the USD Comptroller. As the numbers change, because remember, as they're going through the different channels, that things are going to change. Just because you request X amount of budget for your organization does not mean, and 
most likely is not going to be what you request. So as things change and are finalized, then these systems, these databases are updated to reflect the information. Issue resolution is on the bottom of page 45. They figure that stuff out. If there are any issues, justification necessary, why you want that additional funding and so forth. So page 46, 47 goes into the acquisition relationship to P. So going back, remember the three circles, J sits at the bottom, PPBE, Defense Acquisition System. They overlap to meet the National Defense Strategy. So on page 46 here, it's saying there's a relationship because you need funding. The only way you're going to get money, funding, appropriation, is through the PPBE process. So even though you may go from J sits to Defense Acquisition System, it has to relate to the PPBE process. So acquisition interrelationship, it talks about the defense acquisition board, which we talked about before. Who's in charge of that board? The chairman of the defense acquisition board is the new title with the USD ANS and is co-chaired by the vice chairman of the joint chief of staff, who is a chairman of the JROC. So remember JROC, remember the three circles again? JROC is in charge, the vice chairman is in charge of j -SIDS, but he also sits in the defense acquisition system, which is the defense acquisition board. And then at the top, you have the USD comptroller, you have the USD for policy, you have all these other entities that's in charge to make sure that everybody stays online of meeting the national defense strategy. Cool. So page 47 gives you some more information on the JROC. Remember, keep those circles in mind because as they bring out these individuals, now you can see where do they fit in these circles. So JROC, Joint Requirements Oversight Council, is chaired by the vice chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, and they are responsible for doing the analytical review of the national defense strategy to come up with and identify capability gaps. Where's the capability gap? What do we need to fix that issue? That's the JROC. So you have a chart on page 49, 48, 49. 48 has integrated priority lists, combatant commanders, Issue integrated priority list to identify their issues, what they need. Defense planning guidance, that's the final document in the planning phase of PEEB. The POM, that's the, the way how we package in the programming phase, program objective memorandum, what we request in our programming phase of PEEB. Issue books is at the DOD level. If they identify certain issues in your request, then it's published in an issue book. That means it's like a, what do we call it? A commander summary where you look at the big document and then you have to decide, give a one or two, two page of what's the issue with this document. So that's your issue books. Program decision memorandum, the PDM is the final document in the programming, and I will also say it's the final document in the budgeting phase of P. Let's see, resource management decision, RMD. So if you notice, they mention both the PDM, which is the new name, and they mentioned the old name, which is resource management decision. So that tells me that you can be asked either one, ask either one. So RMD, legacy documents, because the RMD used to be the last document for programming and budgeting. Now it's the PDM, Program Decision Memorandum. Budget estimate submission, that's what it's called when you package the budget. The USD Comptroller packages the budget for submission to OMB. Program budget decision, Ah, hold it, hold it. Obtains a decision in the sector. Ah, okay, so that's important. So what's important here? 
the name of the final document in the programming phase is PDM, Program Decision Memorandum, and the name of the final decision in the budget phase is the Program Budget Decision. And I'm gonna write that now because I didn't catch it until I did it there. Program Budget Decision. And I don't know, did they? Maybe they said it in there, but so P program budget decision is the final document in the budget phase of PPBE. And then program decision memorandum is the final document in programming. All right, so we talked about the press board on um, 49, must be submitted no later than the first Monday in February. The bottom of 49 starts the execution phase. USD Comptroller in charge of it. Two things happen when Congress appropriates the funds. The first legal thing is the Treasury issues the Treasury warrant. That's notification that the law is in place, the account's been set up. And the second thing that happened is OMB begins the apportionment process. The agencies submit the SF-132 to OMB within 10 days, requesting their money, and then OMB has 30 days to issue those apportionment. Now, I, if you notice what I did there, it's not on those pages in front of me, but that falls in line with this process, what I just went over. So every time I come to execution, I repeat that to myself. So I know what's happening that's not on that page. So on page 5051, it talks about what happens when it gets to Congress, when your program gets to Congress, when your budget request gets to Congress. They go through committee hearings, committee justification, committee, <laughs> committee markups, right? They go through this process. In the budgeting phase, the concurrent budget resolution on the bottom of page 50 is what happens when Congress, the House and the Senate determines the guidelines they're going to use to look at the president's budget, the limitation, concurrent budget resolution. And then you go to the authorization process. So the House and Senate Budget Committee will determine the concurrent budget resolution. The authorizers on page 51, what you need to know is which House and which Senate is responsible for the authorization process. That is the House Armed Services Committee and the Senate Armed Services Committee is responsible for the authorization process. So when you go through the programming phase of P, the end result at Congress is the authorization law. The purpose of the authorization law is to authorize programs. Even if it lists money in there, it does not give us any budget authority, does not give us any funding. The purpose of the authorization, so you got to make sure, am I talking authorization process or appropriation process? The House and Senate Appropriations Committee is responsible for the appropriations process in those 12 subcommittees, the different appropriations. And so the Appropriation Committee, one, the end result of that at Congress is the appropriation law, which is what gives us the funding. And if we don't have an appropriation law, the government shut down. Why does the government shut down? Well, because according to the Constitution, Article 1, Section 9, Clause 7 of the Constitution says that no money will be come out of the Treasury unless you have an appropriation law in place. So that's the reason the government shuts down if we don't have an appropriation law, appropriation law, or a continuing resolution, which is a temporary appropriation law. And then the agencies can make appeals if necessary. So resource allocation in the PPBE process on page 52, it tells you that it overlaps all the phases. So if you get a diagram like this and they tell you you're in year number two, it's May, 
then you just follow the line down to see what's happening at that particular time of the year. It's not something that you can remember because it changes every year. So I'm going to stop here for the first part of Module 2, Competency 1, Defense Budget Process. Maybe because this is a long section and I don't, it's already, yeah, it's already a long section. So I want to break this piece up into two entities. And so now we've established the ground rules, the key players, the key documents, the processes involved, PPBE, and then now we can take it into specific appropriations. So the next video will be on specific appropriations. So thank you for stopping by. Be sure to subscribe so that you can get the updates as I continue to update with the 2020 study guide. That's the new, newest study guide that's out. And I want to make sure you have the newest information because I do see some changes from the older study guide. So be sure to stop by again, share this, share, click, like, whatever you want to do. Let me know if you see anything and you have particular questions, feel free to email me, leave a question on the video so that I can address it. So thank you for stopping by. This is Helen Thomas and the CDFM Study Group.